Oh. Um, so this is important so we can, as I said, understand the basic uh, methods of how uh, the ovaries and endometrium respond to the hormones involved in menstruation. We can also help us understand hormonal contraception, which we'll get to later, as well as understand menstrual disorders such as amenorrhea, and um, or heavy menstrual cycles, abnormal uterine bleeding, and the like. So hormones involved um, are gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is um, released by the hypothalamus. This acts on the pituitary, which releases follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And these hormones have uh, in turn. Uh, act on the ovary which then creates estrogen and progesterone and this has a negative feedback on the hypothalamus so um, you see that decrease in the gonadotropin releasing hormone and you have that negative feedback which sets you up for the next cycle um, and so I always you know while there is kind of a, this interplay of positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops um, this is kind of the basic thing to remember when you're trying to explain this to a patient or uh, trying to figure out just how stuff like uh, hormonal contraception works um, and it can help help you kind of just understand the basics of it um, and as we get into more detail later on you'll kind of see how sometimes while we expect there to be a negative feedback there's a positive feedback and when we sit there to be a positive feedback, sometimes there's a negative feedback. Um, so at the hypothalamus, you have gonadotropin releasing hormone, and you know, uh, before puberty, it's not really secreted, but you do see a pulsatile secretion at puberty. Um, this is inhibited by, like we said, estrogen and progesterone, but also prolactin. Um, the pathology that you can see with this is the precocious puberty, which um, is tested by the GnRH stimulation test, um, and Kalman syndrome, which is a congenital absence of GnRH production. <laughs> um, it's you'll uh, see anosmia because the cells uh, don't migrate for the olfactory portion. Um, and the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So you have uh, the loss of GnRH production and hypo, uh, smaller gonads. Um, it's important to note that prolactin inhibits GnRH because you will see that um, in women who exclusively breastfeed, this is the mechanism for that suppression of menstruation and ovulation. So the prolactin stops the GnRH, which then stops the LH and FSH, and you don't have ovulation. And this is only in uh, women who exclusively breastfeed because you know, uh, as soon as you just lose a little bit of that exclusivity, you can have ovulation. Uh, the pituitary uh, gland is next and it does have like we talked about the positive feedback uh, from GnRH <clears throat> the anterior pituitary remember those flat pig hormones uh, FSH LH prolactin sorry about the misspelling uh, growth hormone TSH and ACTH posterior pituitary oxytocin vasopressin pathology noted uh, Notable pathology with the pituitary is Sheehan syndrome. So, uh, a clinical scenario that you might see with this is a woman with uh, a postpartum hemorrhage, and you'll note that they'll have the ischemic necrosis of the anterior pituitary. So, because you've lost function of the anterior, anterior pituitary, you won't have the LH and FSH, which results in oligo or amenorrhea, uh, no prolactin, so they'll they'll complain of inability to breastfeed. No TSH, so you'll see the hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency because you're not having that ACTH 
release. Um, LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH are released by the pituitary. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on those. The ovaries um, are acted upon by LH and FSH, um, and they're responsible for making the oocytes. And you know, as we can kind of remember from way back in the day of uh, embryology, um, a woman's oocytes are all produced before she's even born, and they're arrested in prophase one, and that doesn't. Um, resume, the uh, whole meiosis 2 doesn't resume until ovulation is actually triggered. So uh, the ovaries produce and resume those oocytes and they produce the steroid hormones of estrogen and progesterone. The two cell theory uh, states that LH uh, acts on the theca cells and they produce estrogen. FSH acts on the granulosa cells and they produce progesterone. So now we'll kind of put all the hormones together. I think we've all sort of seen this uh, chart of hormones and uh, the corresponding um, endometrium, what it looks like and what the follicles look like as uh, the cycle continues. And as you note, at the beginning of the cycle, the hormones are low when um, progesterone and estrogen uh, start becoming higher, they do have that negative feedback, so you do see that drop in the LH and FSH. And you can also see when you have that LH spike, um, that LH surge, that's when ovulation occurs. And you can also see that uh, you know the endometrium gets progressively thicker and you have that sloughing which starts menses, and uh, as we know, day one of menses, uh, the first day of menses is what we call day one of the menstrual cycle. So uh, let's start off with the follicular phase and the ovaries. This is what we consider to be estrogen fueled. So initially we have that low estrogen and progesterone phase, and you have that negative feedback. Um, so because it's low, your GnRH is going to be high. And so when you have high GnRH, you're going to have high FSH. This will recruit the follicles. This also causes LH receptors to be expressed on those granulosa cells. Um, when you have the high FSH, you have that uh, high estrogen as well, and that causes an FSH surge. As that GnRH increases, we do see also that LH production. So a lot of luteinizing hormone, which causes that increase in estradiol. So initially, estradiol, although we see it as a negative feedback on GnRH, initially it is a positive feedback for that LH, so you have even more LH going on, and that's the LH surge. This is what triggers meiosis too. Um, and causes ovulation. And after that, estradiol levels drop. Then we get to the luteal phase, and this is more progesterone driven. The remaining follicle cells, the ones that aren't used, um, they become the corpus luteum. This releases uh, inhibin A and estrogen, and that causes that negative feedback then on GnRH. So after that, you see that drop in FSH and FSH receptors. So as that uh, inhibin and estrogen levels decrease after they're being produced, FSH will rise again for that next cycle. So you're getting set up for your next menstrual cycle. Now, the corpus luteum is uh, maintains the endometrium via progesterone if pregnancy occurs because it's rescued by HCG. Um, so now let's take a look at the endometrium. You have the basalis layer and the functionalis layer. The basalis layer isn't doesn't really participate that much in the menstrual cycle. It's just kind of there more as a support structure. The functionalis layer is kind of where everything happens. So the proliferative phase, um, which corresponds to the follicular phase in the ovaries, this is again estrogen driven. So estrogen causes the prol proliferation of the functionalis layer, you see more tortuous glands and the pseudostratification of cells. As progesterone is being increased, we enter the secretory phase and uh, you see the vacuolization of glands. So these glands start making big vacuoles. They move towards the surface. 
the glands become more tortuous, so they get bigger and um, you start seeing them kind of move, like I said again, move towards the surface and uh, get ready to secrete all their products. And you do see the spiral arteries forming. Um, and as progesterone falls, the vasoconstriction in the endometrium occurs, um, and that's when you see that endometrial sloughing. So if pregnancy occurs, the placental trophoblasts start producing HCG. We notice this approximately a week after that LH surge, so a week after ovulation is when you'll start seeing HCG production. Um, and as we know, it doubles every two days. And this binds, um, to the LH receptors on the corpus luteum as well as HCG receptors. So the corpus luteum continues to produce estrogen and progesterone and that's what maintains the pregnancy. So if for whatever reason you actually remove the corpus luteum after fertilization occurred, you would not have that production of estrogen and progesterone and you wouldn't have uh, a pregnancy occur. Um, so if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum can't maintain the estrogen, can't maintain the endometrium because it's not producing estrogen and progesterone. And that's how we have that menses occur because you're having that sloughage of all that endometrial tissue.